It is 8.30 p.m. on the west coast of the United States. That makes it 0300 GMT. It's 428 Legalization Nation, the pot news show with possibly the worst title on the internet. Thank you for watching. Um, we'll be uh, taking your calls and tweets later on in the program. We have a whole bunch of news to get to. Here's a look at some of the stories we are going to be covering uh, in this edition of the show. We're going to take a kind of extended look. And I mean, I know that's the whole point of the show in the first place, but an extended look at the specious arguments, often specious arguments in one degree or another, about keeping marijuana illegal. For many of us, keeping pot illegal is ridiculous as to be absurd, but there are people who, there are anti-legalization people, there are pro-prohibition people, and I felt like one of the things that's really important to try to understand, and this is not an easy thing, understanding why the prohibition people think pot prohibition is correct or appropriate or the right thing to do, um, and there's really no good arguments I've seen so far. And I'm a pretty good, even if I don't agree with an argument, I will still appreciate if, if it's valid or sound or has logic to it or is correct in some way. There's almost none of these arguments that I've come across that seem like they are logical or sound or valid or correct. And even kind of a remotely, I mean, the harder I look, the harder it gets to understand how people of any kind of real rational ability, people who are pro-freedom, people who are pro-health, people who are, you know, uh, against alcohol-based drunk driving, you know, there's all kinds of sort of silly reasons that are purported. Almost none of them have any statistical weight behind them. Almost none of them have any scientific rigor behind them. It's pretty uh, astounding, and it's amusing, which is why I wanted to cover it. Um, why the drought in California will mean stronger marijuana for the people who are there. How the fight against black market pot is going in Colorado. Of course, recreational weed is legal in Colorado, but there's still a black market. We will talk about that. Weed-infused coffee in Washington, the marijuana ads airing in Texas. As far as uh, the breaking news, as far as pot... Oh, by the way, uh, we'll have your calls and tweets. Uh, send me a Twitter message at any time here. Uh, I'll, about halfway through the show, I'll put the phone number up, and you can uh, text me or call me there as well. Um, I was... Uh, commenting with, sort of exchanging comments with a person who watched the show, asking, and I quote, will there be a way to chime in on this show, or is it just a long, boring monologue? Well, uh, it has been a long, boring monologue, partially because I'm still, you know, getting up to, getting used to doing it, and partially because, you know, I've been kind of keeping it under wraps. I don't necessarily want this to be a publicly consumed pro program yet until I get better at it. So I've been doing it for a few weeks kind of quietly. Uh, we're going to start trying to expand it a little bit. The reason this show started, and I will make no excuses or lies about this, is that I wanted to be hired by a radio station in Colorado Springs. This radio station is called 1580 AM K-H-I-G -I Radio. Um, of course, there's an H as well, K-H-I-G-H, -H, but as far as the FCC is concerned, the actual call letters are K-H-I-G. So it's K-H-I-G, unless you do it the way they want you to do it. So it's 1580 K-H-I-G. All weed-based talk shows in Colorado Springs. A little dinky radio station that used to be ESPN Radio. The problem with ESPN Radio is it costs about $50,000 to license that programming for a couple of years. And the mom-and-pop radio stations either can't afford it or find that maybe something like a pot-themed radio station would be more lucrative. And they're probably right. So this program is meant to be uh, a blatant attempt to get a show on there. Because many of the shows you hear on 1580K High generally are... I don't want to say hip hop themed or hip hop based, but it's all, you know, the weed pimps this and, you know, your functional stoner, Bubba Cushman, that, and it's all kind of very, it, the, most of the weed community, including the strains, the names of the strains of pot themselves are very much sort of steeped in that hip hop universe. And I feel like an intellectual stoner approach might be something that also has a place at the table. So do drop a message to the folks on the Facebook page at 1580K High and tell them you know about a guy who does sort of a maybe a college level. If they're doing a high school level talk show about pot, this is the college level talk show about pot, where we talk journalistically and scientifically about news and information coming out regarding pot and the pot community. All right. Uh, let's see. Any other topics I was going to bring up? Uh, marijuana ads in Texas, weed-infused coffee, the black market in Colorado, K 
California is stronger pot from the drought. But let's start with the breaking news in Texas. The breaking news in Texas is that the Texas House in the legislature there has legalized cannabis oil. Now, Texas is not one of those states where we talked about recreational weed is the top step. We talked about the second step being sort of uh, medical marijuana and the third step being decriminalization of people who have pot. And uh, that's what sort of happened in Texas today. Let's take a look at the story from NBCDFW.com. The Texas House okays cannabis oil in a victory for marijuana advocates. So let's look at this story here. The 84th Texas legislature uh, saw a victory for marijuana supporters. At least they're on the brink of it. The Repu Republican-controlled House approved legalizing trace amounts of the cannabis oil that won't produce the high as associated with other parts of marijuana. Parents of children with intractable epilepsy uh, in many states now are talking about how their children is helping control, or how the oil is helping their children by controlling the seizures that they have. These intractable seizures that apparently don't respond to any of the other, you know, Dilantin or the other epilepsy medications that they use. A doctor would have to provide a prescription, of course, since current Texas law does not allow any form of medical marijuana, advocates say this is their most successful legislative session in Texas in history. Other proposals to decriminalize marijuana penalties probably won't pass, but made notable progress after years of being stymied. So as much as it was a laughable thing in Texas before, now the Texas House has okayed cannabis oil for certain uh, medical uses. So it's not medical marijuana in the way we think of it in the states like, what, Arizona, California, places where it's, I believe also Oregon. Um, it's not recreational pot like Colorado or Washington, but it's a step in the right direction. Um, speaking of the right direction, what's the right direction? Legalized pot, okay, you always see that sign at every rally that there has ever been. Ever, I mean, even in, you know, 4,000 years ago when cavemen had large gatherings, there was one guy in the back with a pot leaf on a, you know, rock that he held up so that people could see it. Um, Always is there somebody saying, legalize pot, man, but, you know, why? Because it's illegal, federally. Okay. W why is it illegal federally? Because some people have arguments why it should be illegal. Let's look at some of those arguments, shall we? There's actually been a number of articles sort of discussing it. This got me, I got thinking about this doing one of these pot shows last week where I came across and I actually was researching it and didn't have time for it on the show. This was the NPR station in Phoenix, Arizona. And they talk with the, I guess she's the deputy, or the, sorry, the district attorney in a county in Arizona. Not the county where Phoenix is, but a county nearby. And I'm not going to play the entire radio interview, but I am going to play a piece of it from the website here. This is their station, 91.5 KGZZ. It's KJAZZ, not KJIZZ, for those of you who have kind of a dirty mind. Um, but let's listen to it. And let's hear what just the back end have to say. If you want to listen to the whole thing, it's I do encourage you to listen to it. It's a great Alex little piece. Goldstein in Phoenix. And uh, let's hear the back Our half of the interview. legalizing marijuana never stopped to ask the question, how is it that the drug makes me feel so good? Okay. Uh, that is Sheila Polk, the Yavapai County attorney we hear speaking. I don't know about my ability to really do a good job in specifically targeting the spot of the interview Money's where I want. Going, you know, part of it to public health. This is Carlos Alfaro. Um, a way to better do our marijuana policy. I don't think that there's um, ties of uh, gateway drugs or anything like that. This is not a campaign to, you know, talk about other drugs or anything like that because marijuana is specific to um, being less harmful. Cool. So there's no cool. So there's no, there's not going to be any political battle. On I'm how trying to cue it up here. I'm sorry. Hold on. 40% of it is going to go towards public education, which includes the new facilities and compensation for punish for using something that is All less right. harmful than alcohol. Carlos Alfaro is Arizona political director here we go. of the Marijuana Policy Project. Carlos, thank you. Thank you so much. And that interview with Carlos Alfaro, by the way, was really good. I encourage you to go ahead and seek it out and listen to it. I'm trying not to step on any copyright toads here, but we are going to listen to Sheila Polk talk about why it should be illegal. Goldstein in Phoenix. And now joining me for a few minutes in opposition to the legalization of marijuana is Sheila Polk, Yavapai County Attorney. Sheila, good morning. Thanks for being here. Good morning. Thanks for having me on your show. So what are your biggest concerns before we uh, get into some specifics? My concern is with a drug that is harmful, that is addictive, that is mind-altering, and is particularly harmful to the developing adolescent brain, which develops about the age of 25. 
you know, it always puzzles me that people who are in favor of legalizing marijuana never stop to ask the question, how is it that the drug makes me feel so good? Because the answer is that marijuana is causing profound changes to the brain, both in terms of its function and its structure, in, in ways that are harmful, negative, and can have lifelong negative effects. So my focus is on our kids and our kids' future and what kind of environment do we as responsible adults create for our kids. We know for a fact... Okay, well, I'm going to pause there. there. The kids, right? It's all about the kids. Um, okay, kids, good. We should ban tobacco and alcohol then too? No? Talking about changes in the uh, developing adolescent brain until 25? No? Alcohol doesn't cause damage? No? None of that? All right, well, let's keep listening. It's who you marijuana are much less likely to succeed in school that are long-term all right that sounds like a lie of iq for folks who start young and who use long term in fact show an iq loss of seven to eight points and so my focus is on keeping a substance illegal that we know is harmful and that we know is a significant significant obstacle to our kids and okay i've never heard that iq drop thing ever before but let's go on their successful future I want to ask you about the perception of things as well, because certainly there are people who, who don't want to see underage and kids uh, using marijuana, but there are many underage people who use alcohol, and that can be a real problem. You know, we've heard about binge drinking, we've heard about uh, you know, poor kids over drinking and ending up in horrible accidents. I guess I'm wondering, where is, the, where is the line between alcohol and marijuana, in your opinion? Amen. Let's listen. Well, it's... It's illegal for kids to use alcohol, but you raise a good point, which is alcohol is a product that is legal for adults. And in fact, the result is that twice as many of our kids are using alcohol as use marijuana, a substance that is legal. Sheila, with legalization of marijuana... Okay, so she's. Cons I guess the implication there is that legalizing it will mean more kids will use it. ...increased difficulties for law enforcement. It may seem sort of contradictory, but could it potentially lead to more problems with cartels, I asked Carlos the question about this idea of more hard drugs being used. Maybe not an increase in who's using it, but the fact maybe cartels would say, well, marijuana is no longer something we can make money off of, so we'll have to try these other things. Well, that certainly is the experience that we see come to Colorado already. They legalized marijuana for retail purposes in 2012. About 40% of marijuana that is coming out of Colorado is illegal and in fact is being illegally trafficked to the last time I saw the figure was 40 of the 50 states. So legalizing marijuana in Colorado has not put a damper on illegal trafficking activity at all. In fact... Okay, so she's saying people go to Colorado, buy pot, and take it back home with them. All right, well, I suppose that's probably true. If it seems to have increased it. Do you think national polls that indicate support for legalization show that marketing campaigns are working, or does that show that people have determined for themselves that it makes sense? I think it shows the effect of marketing and um, the effect of propaganda on what people think. Marketing what and propaganda. Though, is if you sit down with a group of people and you talk to them about what this drug actually does, how it harms the brain, and how it's particularly harmful to kids and their learning environment, most people, people will quickly change their mind. And so polls that are out there are pretty basic. The most recent poll for Arizona shows that the majority of Arizonans do not support legalization at this point. Sheila, I'm wondering when it comes to, again, we talked about alcohol and, and use for adults. Um, what if, if this potential ballot initiative were written in such a way that said people 25 and older could legally use it, based on what you said about the developing brain, would that change your opinion at all? Well, not at all. The problem is the single most effective way to keep our kids from using marijuana is to keep it illegal. If you legalize it, even though it's legal only for adults, we know for a fact that far more kids use. That's certainly the experience. That sounds like an argument for making alcohol illegal and not for making marijuana legal. Out of Colorado. We're not against kids, making marijuana legal. 12 to 17 are now using marijuana at 38% higher than the national average. And a study that was done for Arizona determined that if, if marijuana is legal, 32,000 of our school students who have never tried marijuana indicate that they would be more likely to try it. The fact is that when something is legal, it is more acceptable. And the public thinks, well, if it's legal, it's safe. 
And if something is legal, it is more accessible. Okay, I don't think anybody thinks that if it's legal, it's safe. Alcohol and tobacco, again, I mean, you keep going back to it, obviously, but it's staring you straight in the face. You can make the argument about trans fat, fatty foods, uh, gasoline. Gasoline's legal. <laughs> it's dangerous if you use it wrong uh, or inappropriately. I don't know. I feel like there's a lot to bang your head into a wall about when it comes to arguments for continuing prohibition. Let's look at a couple of these articles that I found because I feel like it's fascinating to consider. One of these guys is Bill Bennett. We've heard of him. He was like the drug czar. This is from Forbes magazine. Um, and I was reading this, so it's not quite at the beginning. Um, I'm going to try and go a little bit fast through it because it's a little bit long. But again, look up this Forbes article from February of 2015. Bill Bennett's confusing, confusing defense of pot prohibition. Um, uh, this is continued from page two. Hold on. Okay, that's the problem. I'm on page three of three. I need to go back to page one. Um, there's the book, by the way, Going to Pot, Why the Rush to Legalize Marijuana is Harming America. Oops. Um, went a little too far there. But yeah, it's Bill Bennett, the former drug czar, who's written a book now talking about, and it's, 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 it's uh, cited in here as Bennett and White. So it is William J. Bennett and Robert White. With marijuana, they say, they have inexplicably suspended all normal rules of reasoning and knowledge. The So, and then I like this sentence from the author in Forbes. You can't say they didn't warn us because these two authors seem like they have suspended all normal rules of reasoning and knowledge. Former drug czar and secretary of education makes his living as a conservative pundit and talk radio host. I didn't know that. He has a radio show. And White, a New Jersey lawyer, is that most Americans support marijuana legalization, having discovered through direct and indirect experience that cannabis is not the menace portrayed in all the propaganda. Um, interesting that that lady from the Yavapai County in Arizona, that district attorney lady, was talking about the propaganda. Cheese against the propaganda. Well, guess what? Uh, it turns out the propaganda seems to largely be on the other side of the argument especially going all the way back to reefer madness, shall we say. But let's talk about this. To make the familiar seem threatening again, Bennett and White argue that marijuana is both more dangerous than it used to be because it's more potent and more dangerous than we used to think because recent research has revealed long-lasting and permanent serious health effects. The result is a rambling, repetitive, self-contradicting hodgepodge of scare stories, misleading comparisons, unsupportable generalizations, and deep contextualized research results. I, I went through this just to spare you the whole thing. It's three pages on Forbes.com. Great read if you really want to get down into it. I'm worried about sort of keeping people's interest a bit on this show. But um, essentially, it's kind of everything you would expect. We'll go. We'll gloss through it really fast here just so I can do it. I'm going to do it in under five minutes if I can. Uh, but let's just look at it really fast. They exaggerate the increase in potency. What they do is uh, use the two extremes. They talk about weed has gone from 3 to 4% THC a few decades ago to close to 40%. Uh, they're taking the extreme outliers from both ends. Now, there's no question these authors say that average THC has increased substantially because Americans are getting better at growing pot. Consumers generally view that as an improvement since it makes pot smoking safer. You can achieve the same effect while ingesting less pot. So, yes, I mean, especially when you consider the amount of overdosing, which is essentially zero as far as the scientific research and uh, the scientific statistics are concerned um making it stronger seems to i mean if you it, you know here's what i think is a great thing they talk about you cannot consider it the same substance when you look at the dramatic increase in potency it is like comparing a 12 ounce glass of beer with a 12 ounce glass of 80 proof vodka both contain alcohol but have vastly different effects on the body when consumed how many people do you know who treat 12 ounces of vodka the same as 12 ounces of beer? Drinkers tend to consume less of stronger products, and the same is true of pot smokers, something Bennett and White never consider. Um, they criticize evidence of marijuana's benefits as merely anecdotal, yet what do they do? Yes, they intersperse their text with personal testimonials about the harm. So they use anecdotes as much as they say the marijuana advocates use anecdotes. The problem is, when it comes down to research yeah the it turns out most of it's on the side of the marijuana advocates uh, they do google searches on marijuana paired with possible dangers 
and then present the alarming headlines that pop up as if they conclusively verify those dangers. They cite any study that reflects negatively on marijuana, often repeatedly, as though it were the final word on the subject. No study in any form anywhere is the final word on anything. A study is just a study, even if it draws some conclusion. Most of them don't. Occasionally, they acknowledge the studies they favor have been criticized on method method methodological grounds or that other studies have generated different results. That's what happens when you can't repeat the results of a scientific study or your study has methodological problems. Turns out that study gets less credit or less, you know, uh, it becomes less relevant in the truth seeking paradigm that we all know. Um, it just goes on like that. I mean, it goes on and on. They argued that even the possibility of bad outcomes, such as IQ loss, psychosis, or addiction to other drugs, is enough to oppose legalization. Um, and then they go on this little statistical you know, rampage that's a bunch of crap as well. They hypothesize severe skepticism and say, all these studies have a 5% chance of being right. Then they say the continued prohibition of marijuana is justified because the painkiller Vioxx was pulled from the market when it was discovered 3.5% of its users suffered heart attacks. Um, what they're doing is conflating the 5% chance that a drug poses any danger with a 5% chance that a given user will suffer serious harm. Those are not the same thing. Um, and they put a lot of effort into arguing quite unconvincingly that marijuana is at least as harmful as tobacco and alcohol, even though they repeatedly say it doesn't matter if that's true. More than smoking alcohol or uh, smoking tobacco or drinking alcohol, smoking marijuana can damage the heart, lungs, and brain. More than smoking tobacco, nonsense. Um, the, the argument is that marijuana is simply not, uh, it is simply untrue that tobacco is more harmful than marijuana is what the quote from the book is. Let's move to page two real fast. Uh, they never actually substantiate these claims because they can't. As measured by acute toxicity, impact on driving ability, frequency of addiction, or long-term effects of heavy consumption, alcohol is clearly more dangerous than pot. That's four different metrics where they're talking about how alcohol is, without question, statistically more dangerous. Um, the point has been acknowledged by Obama, his drug star, and the co-founder of a leading anti-pot group. The difference in risk is also re recognized by a large majority of Americans kind of wonder what that link says. Uh, could we look at that really fast? Polling report drugs. Um, well, it doesn't appear to be loading. Ah, it is loading. Um, I don't know if you're looking at what I'm looking at. I'm going to make sure that I've switched to the correct screen here, just so I can bring up this poll on drugs. Illegal drugs. Do you think the use of marijuana should be legal or not? This is from April 2015 from CBS News. Uh... And now I've actually forgotten what it was. Oh, yes, the difference in risk between marijuana and other drugs. Okay. The difference in risk comparing marijuana to other drugs is probably down here a bit. Um, have you ever tried marijuana? Do you think the use of marijuana should be made legal or not? Have you yourself ever happened to try marijuana? About 49% in most of these polls seem to say yes of all the respondents. Uh, should it be legal or not? Okay, which of the following substances would you say is most harmful? Tobacco, alcohol, sugar. Sugar outweighs marijuana by almost two to one as far as dangerous to a person's overall health. If you had to choose just one, which would you say is the most harmful? I can't believe 15% of people said sugar over tobacco or sugar over marijuana. Um, do you think government should focus more on prosecuting people who use illegal drugs or should it focus more on providing treatment for people? Treatment, 67%. Um, states moving away from mandatory prison sentences for nonviolent offenders. Is this a good or bad thing? 63% say it's a good thing. Um, on and on. This is a really interesting page about polling. Now, you wonder if they cherry pick the data. I always wonder if they cherry pick the data on a story like that. I've never heard of the website, pollingreport.com. Um, it almost seems like, I mean, it's certainly not uh, Gallup. You know, this is not the Pew poll we're talking about, but um, those are, those do seem to be legitimate polls from legitimate organizations who know how to poll properly and com compare numbers to previous polls of the same questions uh, from the same rough sample of people and uh, make it a little bit interesting. 
The tobacco, or the argument rather, that marijuana is just as deadly as tobacco is equally bizarre, relying on the findings of a few scattered studies without regard to their strength or reproducibility. Uh, marijuana, like tobacco, causes lung cancer and cardiovascular disease. According to a review by the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment, there is mixed evidence for whether or not marijuana smoking is at all associated with lung cancer. They explain that mixed evidence indicates both supporting and opposing scientific findings for the outcome, with neither direction dominating. There is limited evidence that marijuana use may increase risk for heart attack and some forms of stroke. And by limited evidence, they mean modest scientific findings that support the outcome, but have statistically significant limitations. Um, in other words, the hazards they're talking about are unproven. So. Bennett and White quote a surgeon, Eric Valeries, on that point. Some argue one or two joints a day of exposure to these carcinogens doesn't even come close to the one to two packs per day a cigarette smoker experiences. While this may mathematically make sense, the fact is we do not know of a safe level for such exposures. Um, so they're conceding that any lung cancer risk from smoking marijuana, assuming there is one, would be much lower than the risk observed in tobacco smokers, even daily users. Still, he says that doesn't mean tobacco or smoking marijuana is completely safe. So it's kind of a bait and switch, as these people say. Um, the Centers for Disease Control says alcohol plays a role in 88,000 deaths a year, tobacco 400. Marijuana, although it's probably not zero, okay. Stone drivers do get into fatal crashes. As for the higher death and damage rates, it is at present, they say, correct to say more deaths are caused by those two legal substances than marijuana. It is also true that alcohol and tobacco are far more widely used, uh, suggesting that if marijuana were as popular, the marijuana death toll would be in the neighborhood of half a million a year. But they accidentally concede this by their own wording. The number of marijuana-related deaths is much, much smaller, not just in at terms of absolute numbers, but as a percentage. They say there are seven times as many drinkers as pot smokers. If marijuana were as dangerous, we would see about 12,000 marijuana-related deaths a year. Uh, we would see, if tobacco and marijuana were equally dangerous, we'd see 150,000 marijuana-related deaths a year on the conservative side. Obviously, this is absurd. And they eventually admit there is no level of marijuana that is actually completely safe. Although the point was supposed to be marijuana is at least as harmful as tobacco and alcohol. So again, they're changing, they're moving the goalposts. Um, and they just are, go on on sort of making statements that may or may not be true. They're just kind of making these claims without anything to back it up, scientifically or otherwise. Um, they use all this anecdotal evidence. And those of us who have taken a critical thinking class or a reasoning class maybe know that you can't do that and have any sort of believability. Um, while there are dangerous substances that are legal, we would be very ill-advised to add one more product, marijuana, to the list of things Amer Americans should be able to freely obtain and use. We can add to the menu of dangerous substances available to our citizens, or we can draw a line and admit we are surfeited. This is a word I don't see a lot. Surfeited? Surfeited? I know we could look it up, but I feel like you get the idea. Um, draw a line and admit we are confounded with the problems that already exist. We have our plate full, right? Um, this is the real crux of their argument. Uh, in the case of marijuana prohibition, use of force includes hundreds of thousands of arrests per year, nearly 700,000. In 2013, the vast majority, 88% of those 700,000 people, simply were possessing marijuana and were arrested. When there is an arrest for possession, it is usually of a large quantity, a lot of pounds. Well, if that were true, there would be a lot more people charged with intent to distribute and a lot fewer charged with simple possession. Um, so they, they show a median amount of marijuana seized, about 115 pounds. I think it is pretty clear that most people arrested for possessing pot don't have 115 pounds of pot on them. That comes from a study of federal cases, which account for a tiny fraction of total marijuana arrests, but tend to involve large quantities. All right. Uh, even as they inaccurately claim that people caught with marijuana typically have a lot of pounds. I mean, that itself is sort of a suspicious looking phrase. Bennett and White say the arrests are no big deal because they do not result in jail or prison sentences generally. Around 40,000 marijuana offenders, nevertheless, are serving sentences as long as life for growing a plant or distributing its products, produce, it says. 
even if cannabis consumers don't spend time behind bars, they suffer all kinds of other, you know, uh, humility, humiliation, cost, inconvenience, loss of liberty. That's no small thing, but Bennett and White shrug it off, likening marijuana to drunk driving, burglary, and theft. The fact that people arrest a lot of people, that police arrest a lot of people for those offenses doesn't mean drunk driving, burglary, and theft should be decriminalized. The crucial distinction, of course, is marijuana in someone's pocket doesn't run over pedestrians. It doesn't break into people's homes. It doesn't steal their wallets. Bennett do not begin to grapple with the question of how it can be just to treat people as criminals when the actions violate no one's rights. They simply take it as a given that the government not only has a right but a duty to keep the public safe from harm. They maintain if an action is worthy of being illegal, they maintain that an action is worthy of being illegal if it is something that hurts individuals or society. Okay, the hurts of society from potheads, again, is, is what? Um, uh, they make no distinction between self-regarding behavior and actions that harm others. Again, that's sort of a big problem. Here's how they sum up the moral objection to marijuana prohibition. What is the ultimate right being argued for? At the end of the day, the right is, simply put, a right to get and be stoned. This, it seems to us, is a rather ridiculous right upon which to charge a hill. That's like saying freedom of speech is the right to tweet about the latest episode of American Idol, or that freedom of religion is the right to believe silly things and engage in pointless rituals. It is true as far as it goes, but it overlooks the broader principle. Drug prohibition dictates to people what they can take into their body and what states of consciousness they may seek, thereby running roughshod over the principle that every man is sovereign over his body and mind. Um, even if marijuana is not as bad as they say, Bennett and White ask, do we need it? They think cannabis customers need to justify their freedom when it is prohibitionists who need to justify forcibly imposing pharmacological preferences on others. Again, alcohol is good because why? People like it. It's legal. Uh, okay, well, some people like American Idol. That's popular, right? That doesn't mean it's the only show that should be on television. It doesn't mean other shows aren't worthy of existing or worthy of being watched. I mean, there's all kinds of just conceptual problems with that that really are so, you know, I mean, I, it's one thing to say it's ludicrous to want to prohibit pot for pot prohibition. It's ridiculous. It's one thing to say that. But to try and wrap your head around the argument from a purely log logical, purely theoretical point of view is so hard. I mean, it gives me a headache. I actually have a headache from just even trying to work through this and figure out what they're talking about. And there's another article here I was going to look at even more briefly, just for a second, from Reason.com, wrapping up the, uh, the sort of part of this, trying to consider what the anti-pot people are really thinking. Next Thursday, this person is, and this is from today, so it may be worth checking out Glenn Beck's radio show just once because the Robert White, the guy White in that previous article, is going to debate this author, Jake Sullum, on Glenn Beck's radio show about legalization of pot. Each of us will get a half an hour to make their case before taking questions from Glenn Beck and each other. Good Lord God, Glenn Beck. I thought he was dead. I wish he was dead. Um, a few days before, because, I mean, you know, he's, he's a, a glaringly you know, post-alcoholic sort of Republican asshole for one thing, but, uh, uh, you know, for another thing, it's just like, he, he was kicked off of Fox News. You know how bad you have to be to get kicked off a of Fox News channel? Um, anyway, the marijuana prohibition is unscientific. He goes through why, um, and that's the best one, because I, I'm a big guy on science and numbers, and that one has lots of good numbers and science in it. Marijuana prohibition is unconstitutional. I am less about law theory, but they go through a pretty interesting history here that I did not know. When dry activists sought to ban alcohol, they changed the Constitution, which before ratification of the 18th Amendment did not authorize Congress to prohibit the production and sale of intoxicating liquors. Congress couldn't do it until they ratified the 18th Amendment. Um, when Congress banned marijuana, it used the Marijuana Tax Act, a revenue measure that authorized regulations aimed at collecting taxes on production and distribution, but by the time marijuana uh, prohibition was incorporated into the Controlled Substances Act, Congress just relied on its constitutional authority to regulate commerce with foreign nations. I mean, it, this gets very, very sort of convoluted very fast, but they talk about the Commerce Clause, talk about the New Deal, 
and the Supreme Court. So again, that's worth looking at on page one of this article on reason.com. Again, this is just from today. And then they talk about sort of the theoretical, philosophical unjustness of jailing people for possessing marijuana. And again, this article also originally appeared on Forbes.com. So there's been a lot of good coverage of sort of the other side or sort of, you know, giving the prohibitionist people a chance to say why. Okay, we're worried about our kids. Well, we got to have pot illegal because of the kids. Alcohol is legal. That's an argument. Again, that is an argument for re prohibiting alcohol rather than keeping pot illegal. Um, you know, the IQ thing, I think, is specious. I don't remember seeing scientific studies that significantly statistically show a lower IQ of marijuana users. Um, I don't know. It's going to be interesting, and we'll cover the Glenn Beck Hour. I'll listen to it, uh, and I'll try to sort of maybe lift some good bits from it, if at all possible, and bring them to you here. Uh, as far as, uh, you know, listening to Glenn Beck, I'll step up and do that. Anyway, all right, it's uh, 420 Legalization Nation. Uh, again, it's the worst name for a show like this, but I did Google it, and it doesn't appear to be taken, probably because it's the worst name for such a show. I have often gone on here and said, by the way, I'm actually not high. Last time I got high was months and months ago. It was in January when I was in Colorado for New Year's. Um, so, you know. I'd love to be able to get high, but you know, it's just one of those things where I'm working on getting a new job and I'm trying to keep the pee clean. And, you know, I would enjoy myself if I were able, but in the meantime, it's okay to be able to do a show like this and sort of try and fight the good fight. Um, let's look at some news regarding marijuana because now, of course, you can buy marijuana infused coffee pods on the West Coast. This from consumerist.com about three days ago. Uh, everyone knows the best part of waking up is staying in your soft pants all day and eating cereal while watching blah, blah, blah. Uh, they now are pairing your cup of joe with marijuana to start the day. Brewing up a steaming cup of THC-infused marijuana is within your reach if you happen to live in Seattle, where recreational pot is legal. Yahoo Finance reports one Seattle pot shop is selling pods of premium-infused coffee for 10 bucks a pop. Each pod contains 10 milligrams of THC and fits in a standard single-serve coffee maker. I liken it to a Red Bull and vodka, the manager says. I had more energy, but I still had the relaxation you get from cannabis. This isn't the first commercial coffee cannabis combination, as a California company sells also sells marijuana-infused coffees, teas, and creamers. All right, now we're talking my thing, tea. I'm not a coffee guy, but I love a good cup of tea, lemon tea particularly. Um, and they're hoping to move to Nevada when medical marijuana businesses open up shop there. And let's look at the Yahoo Finance story on this just real fast. Uh, do we get to, get to see a picture of it, or is it just a generic cup of coffee? I guess it's, I mean, it's not going to look any different. Um, and there's a Keurig. Oh, okay. There's actually a Keurig K cup with the pot stuff in there. No, that's decaffeinated French roast. I don't know. Oh, and there's a big pot bud. Okay, great. That's really great. You gotta love those really generic photo montages that these news sites put up. It's like nobody really bothers to try anything at all. All right, let's look at a couple of other states before we stop with the news here. Uh, in Tennessee, it's one of those states where you wouldn't really expect it to be legal, but let's take a look at it. And uh, marijuana extract is now legal there, but can you get it in Tennessee? Uh, let's look at this story. CBD oil to treat severe epilepsy has been legalized, much like we saw in Texas earlier in the show. State and federal laws conflict. Of course they do. Um, again, this is a particular extract that doesn't get you high, but does help intractable epileptic seizures. I cannot fathom why anybody would ever vote against a substance that has a medical benefit and doesn't get you high, even if it comes from the evil weed. Um, initially, the legalization of non-intoxicating cannab Cannabidiol oil, I guess is how you pronounce that. It can't be cannabidiol, can it? It's cannabidiol, I guess. It was sought for child victims of particularly severe forms of epilepsy, but the final bill has made CBD available for anyone suffering from debilitating seizures. Go Tennessee. That seems almost surprisingly reasonable. There's enough evidence of the effectiveness to convince former opponents like Dr. Sanjay Gupta of the great channel, CNN, I say that with sarcasm. I don't believe CNN is a great channel at all. However, many Tennessee families are still in the dark about whether it's available, what the procedures are for getting it, 
and how the process of determining eligibility is supposed to work. Adding problems these families don't need are questions as to whether CBD is still illegal under federal law and whether out-of-state providers are violating the law. Answers are important because CBD cannot be made in Tennessee. That's the problem. They can't make it in Tennessee, but it's okay there to have or take or use. Um, the answers are far from clear. The folks at Normal in Tennessee say they're inundated with requests for information. Um, however, the Mathis family of Greene County has been ready for a change. They have a 16-month-old daughter who suffers hundreds of seizures a day. Think about that. Think about that stupid woman in uh, whichever county it was in Phoenix. We listened to it at the beginning. Think about that moron, white, I was going to say Bill Bennett, but also this guy, white, this New Jersey attorney who's writing these absurd you know and i mean I, I say they're absurd not just because i disagree with it people who disagree with it can disagree and call stuff absurd but it truly is absurd in a logical sense the stuff they're saying does not ring true on the surface and if you dig down into it they're straight up lying like it is essentially bullshit the stuff that they're claiming and sort of these theoretical things they throw out about alcohol being as safe or as dangerous or marijuana being worse than tobacco. Um, it's literally ludicrous on a very, very meaningful level. And I feel like it's not just embarrassing, it is anger inducing. That is not fair. These people are just lying because, oh, I'm against it. I'm against it. I'm against it. And, you know, they don't have a reasoning. I would love to talk to these people. Why? Oh, well, it's for the kids. Well, why? Oh, because uh, it lowers your IQ. Yeah, but, you know, any good brand of scotch will do that, to quote the great Scotty from Star Trek, the original series. Um, anyway, here's the procedures from this mother. The girl who has these seizures as a mother we were talking about, and here are the procedures she has to go through for obtaining it. Under Federal Controlled Substances Act, CBD oil and all other plants are still Schedule One substances, meaning there are no recognized legitimate medical uses. Tell me that itself is not backwards. Even alcohol, I believe, has some recognized legitimate medical use. There are, however, narrow channels where aspects of existing law are being bypassed for now. CBD is still somewhat illegal, but this law will protect parents once you get the CBD inside the state of Tennessee. It has to be made elsewhere and brought to Tennessee. For instance, it's legal in Colorado, where they have one of the most effective versions called Charlotte's Web. But how do you get it in Tennessee? I mean, hello, move to Colorado. Um... There is a group called Realms of Caring Helping Parents Get It. Those families were leaving the state, joining a number of marijuana refugees desperate to get help for their children. Think about that term. A substance declared illegal 45 years ago is now causing refugees in the United States of America because of this bizarre, unscientific, backward way of thinking that is completely unsupportable by any logic, any statistics, or any math or medical science you want to talk about. We thought we would have to go to move to help our daughter. With the help of this compassionate care organization, they're able to get it, which now ships CBD to 48 states. <sighs> um, this is a great article from the Tennessean.com, and again, this is from today's news, so this is very, very fresh. $600 a bottle for this material, but if you're an ROC client at checkout, your price will be $250. So uh, you can get it cheaper. And I mean, think about if you're able to help your daughter who has hundreds of seizures a day, I mean, you'd climb any mountain, you'd pay any price. That's actually a really great, it's less than half the original price. Um, and then they're talking about this school uh, let's see here. I'm trying to read. They pilot test supposed to be run by Vanderbilt University using an in-state product developed by Tennessee Tech. The Drug Enforcement Administration didn't give permission to the school, meaning the test program was dead, and thus the school risked losing critical funding research without the DEA's authorization. And so the, rather than lose that federal money, they went ahead and said, fuck it. Um, we need that money too much. There were all these strings attached, and now it's like the strings have been cut. Uh, and a, a website here, in a, a PDF actually, discussing the federal government's eight stipulations that product sales in legal states not be diverted across state lines. So, I mean, then you've got another set of laws where it's illegal 
if, if you buy it in a state where it's legal, it's you know to possess it, but you can't make it in the state of Tennessee. And now this law that stops you from legally taking it across any state lines. Um, the feds may be looking the other way, but that should not be conflated with legal. Uh, uh, it's so infuriating at times. I mean, to do a show like this is enormous fun for me because I feel like it's kind of, you know, the anti side has very little legs legally or philosophically to stand on. They're standing on train tracks going like this, hoping they're going to stop an oncoming express train. And it's just hilarious in a way. But then you think of that poor girl who has hundreds of seizures a day and a pill over there in Colorado that can help her, but it's against federal law to make it. It's against another federal law to transport it to the where, state where you are. And it's just barely legal in the state where you are to even possess it or take it for a medical reason. It doesn't get you high. You know, it's literally purely medicinal. There is no, you know, in the olden days, they used to talk about ah, the medical marijuana. That's just a bunch of people who want to get high and want to stay high. And that's all it is. They're just say, claiming back pain and they're claiming migraines because they just want to be able to legally get high. Those assholes. Um, this is a substance that doesn't get you high, but it stops seizures and it's still being fought. It's still being argued against. It's still being prohibited. Uh, it really is, I mean, anger inducing on one side. It's very sad on the other side. Let's shift gears to Colorado. Uh, they do have a black market of weed in Colorado. And yes, uh, fighting the black market and the everyday challenges of selling legal weed. Um, there you have it. By the way, uh, don't forget, you can participate by commenting, tweeting, whatever. Um, and I promised I was going to check on my other... I was going to check on my other chat room here to see if indeed there were comments being included about marijuana. It doesn't look like my friends in the Trekkie chat are talking about uh, medical marijuana. So I, I kind of promised them I'd check in for comments. It doesn't look like there are any. Um, let's look at this from internationalbusinesstimes.com. Selling weed is pretty hard, and selling it legally, at least, isn't all THC-infused lollipops and rainbows. The six-year cannabis industry veteran came to Colorado from Long Island, New York, after discovering Boulder on his way, blah, blah, blah. Every single aspect of the industry requires a fair amount of consciousness and due diligence. Your daily sales have to be loaded into MED, I don't know, the Marijuana Enforcement Division, Colorado's pot cops. At the end of the night, all your weights have to be accurate. You have to account for anything that drives up or goes missing. Every day you've got to do an accounting. Um, so, going on about the life of a legal pot seller... And I was hoping to get to the part about the competing black market. Here we go. The competing black market dealers who have done, who have none of the costs of operating a lawful business and often have access to product of similar quality. Marijuana advocates long suggested that legalization would be the key to wiping out the black market, but almost a year and a half into Colorado's legal pot, that hasn't been the case. Um, He's doing business the old-fashioned way, this guy is. The dealer spoke with International Business Times on condition of anonymity in part to avoid arrest, but also because, primarily because, he fears backlash from people in the legal industry with whom he once worked. He used to sell it legally. He owned a business that operated out of a modest building. He grew disillusioned following what he saw as excessive regulation, uncertainty, and taxation. Um, and college educated, previously struggling to keep up with rapidly rising rents, he says he now operates his marijuana business much the same way he did in high school, out of his car. Um, so Amendment 64 issue, ushered in a new era of business, allowing for pot to be sold recreational as well as medicinally. Again, all of that sort of severely regulated by the government. And, you know, I'm not against that. I don't, I don't really object to any of that. But, uh, you know, I feel like when you know someone, as I do, and I just chimed in, by the way, a friend of mine who's actually watching currently and listening, we're talking about uh, selling pot illegally versus legally, um, in a state where it's completely illegal, even medical marijuana is illegal, this is a person who now has something on his record that prevents him from getting, you know, uh, real jobs. His crime was just a pot crime. You know what I'm saying? It was not heroin. It was not murder. It was not theft. It was not burglary. It was not, you know, hit and run. It was nothing that hurt anybody. 
but now he's struggling with being able to get certain jobs simply because of this, you know, record he has. So my hat's off to you, buddy, and I appreciate you chiming in and being here. Um, back to this article really fast. It's just insane. Um, which article was I reading? Yes. Uh, his clandestine delivery service is just a tiny part of the equation in the state's black market. A look at that truck with the 420 logo behind it. Um, this is at the 420 Festival. I guess that would be April 20th in Denver's Civic Center Park. Everybody getting high. Um, back in March, authorities in Colorado announced the arrest of Tree Trong Nguyen. Win, I guess is that how you pronounce that last name. It's Vietnamese, I think. That guy, his wife, and 30 others were busted in the largest marijuana trafficking ring since legalization was passed. Authorities had seized 4,600 pounds of marijuana, excuse me, nearly 200 marijuana, 2,000 marijuana plants, 10 pounds of hash oil, 1.4 million in cash. The investigation shut down one of the largest and most sophisticated criminal enterprises uncovered since Colorado voters passed the amendment in 2000. Um, Nguyen's drug ring is further evidence of Colorado's thriving black market. So I guess in the way you think of like the black market of tobacco, right? There is such a thing. Yeah, I'm not a smoker, never have been, so it's completely off my radar screen. But there are people who sell tobacco, I guess, for a cheaper price than you pay at the regular store because it's not got taxes associated with it, right? It's the black market of that sort of thing. So I guess this is like that. Um, Oh, I have to show you before we switch away from that article. Yes, this is a good graph because look at the number of arrests. Colorado marijuana related arrests. 2010, 8,700. 2011, 8,500. 2012 came back up, almost 9,000. This is strictly for possession, by the way. And then 2013 and 2014, look at that. Pretty amazing. What about arrests for distribution? <laughs> almost no arrests for distribution last year. Um, cultivation, very similar, although the 2014 numbers did go up. And the total of number of arrests, over 10,000 arrests total in Colorado in 2010, compare that to 2,000. So these people who want to keep it illegal talk about crime. And that you go into Colorado and you see the arrests. Uh, you know, I, I, we're not seeing crime statistics that thwart that, you know, that stymie those numbers we just looked at. You don't see an increase in car crashes or DUI arrests or burglaries for people who need to get their pot but can't afford it or, you know, whatever the hell. Um, it's it's pretty astounding. Anyway, uh, that's another good article from the folks at IBT Times, the International Business Times. And again, that's brand new as of today. Uh, real fast, uh, we're coming up on the end of the program here, but do chime in as my friend did. Uh, let me throw the number up on the screen. Uh, feel free to text that number, 310-776-5869. You can call that number too. There's a chance I may or may not be able to uh, get to vo you know, talk with you voice tonight because I have a lot of information we're going through here and we're kind of coming up on the end of the show. 310-776-5869. That's 310-776-COONS. I always answer every tweet that I get uh, and... By the way, uh, hello to my new friend watching from YouTube. Uh, it amused me, just to shift gears a little bit toward the end of the show, uh, somebody said they couldn't use Twitter, and I'm trying to remember exactly the phrasing. I believe they said they couldn't use Twitter because it is a conglomerate to keep marijuana illegal, as is anyone who is using it. That was what the person said to me as uh, the reason why they couldn't communicate with me on Twitter. Now, it's not a requirement. There's a million other ways. You can call, you can text, you can email, you can tweet. There's, I mean, that's on purpose that I have all these different ways. But Twitter is a conglomerate to keep marijuana illegal, as is anyone who is using Twitter. Now, I went online and did a search for marijuana on Twitter. Just pulled up the search for the word marijuana on Twitter, and here's what I see. An ad for CNN talking about one of their pot-related shows. Uh, a graph about Alzheimer's, the National Geographic cover where they talk about the science of marijuana, the Patriot News. This is actually a regular news outlet about the Pennsylvania medical marijuana situation. The marijuana account, just at marijuana. Marijuana policy, okay. Another story about the Texas cannabis oil that we covered at the beginning of the show. Um, community begs to keep Canada, cannabis supplier out of jail, marijuana 420. There's another, it's, I mean, there's not any 
anti-pot stuff even really here, except for this story where Robin Thicke apparently gave his puppy pot treats, or the puppy somehow ate pot treats and had to go to the vet, I guess. Um, okay, here's one that's anti-pot. Oakland airport baggage handlers accused of smuggling marijuana. That's not anti-pot. That's just sort of a news story about Oakland baggage handlers accused of smuggling pot. Um, another pot seizure. But I mean, really, if you compare the number of people who are, um, the number of accounts, the number of entries, the number of things you see on Twitter that are pro-marijuana versus anti or neutral, you don't see anybody on here trying to say marijuana is good. It's good that it's illegal. You know, you can't really see. Oh yeah. And this is actually amusing. <laughs> I can't believe Obama's Twitter username is POTUS. Is this a joke? Pot US. Wow. Way to shove the recreational marijuana movement down our throats. I don't know if that is I don't know if that is a sort of a joke or not, but that's really funny. Um another news story I wanted to bring to you before we got out of here, and I uh feel like I failed to pull it up, so let me open my notes really fast. This is a story regarding the drought in San Francisco. Now not just San Francisco, it's all of California experiencing this drought. And um, it's pretty serious, actually. It's not a small situation. Uh, this drought is very, very severe, and it's not getting better quickly. But one thing that the drought does seem to mean, as this CBSlocal.com article in San Francisco says, marijuana grown in California will be more potent because of the drought. Um, the Daily Climate reports climate change could also play a huge role in the number of people growing marijuana on public lands, which would put increased strain on the ecosystem. Um, a small portion of plant species have adapted to lower carbon dioxide levels, but most, including marijuana, still feel deprived. So marijuana grown outdoors will likely become stronger and require less water. Um, again, it's one of those weird things you never thought you'd even really hear, but there it is. This one scientist, this re retired USDA ethnobotanist said, when plants are stressed, like is often the case during a drought, they tend to exhibit more of their medicinal properties. And so uh, these counties, the Emerald Triangle, they call it, marijuana counties, or marijuana growing counties, Mendocino, Humboldt, Trinity County, California, in the north, have seen a doubling of pot production between 09 and 12, according to a California Department of Fish and Wildlife study. The amounts of water these grocers are using has some biologists concerned about what it will mean for everything from fish and wildlife habitat to aquatic water and water quality. So there's a million issues where the illegal pot growers, and I guess even in some cases the legal medicinal pot growers are, but isn't that interesting? The drought stresses plants. Plants that are stressed because of drought exhibit more medicinal properties and require less water. And uh, I think it's fascinating. All right. Have I covered all of these stories I was hoping to cover in this hour of the uh, program? Um, I think I have. Stoner infused coffee. Let's look at the Texas ads really fast. There's ads in Texas. Uh, oh, how to open a medical marijuana dispensary in Hawaii. I have literally more information than I'm able to bring to you. We'll look at this real fast because in case you're in Hawaii, my friend in Hawaii said, oh, it's in Oahu, so fuck it. Um, but the U.S. Cannabis Pharmaceutical Research and Development Company is hosting a seminar on how to set up a medical marijuana dispensary, as well as discussions on risks and opportunities. It is coming up in just under a month at the Marriott Resort Waikiki Beach. If there's ever a place to have a pot and seminar, you got to do it in Hawaii, uh, Oahu, or Hawaii. The bill allows for eight dispensary licensees in the state. This, this bill was passed in the state legislature, House Bill 321. It legalizes medical marijuana dispensaries in Hawaii, including two in Maui County. Um, the bill still awaits the governor's signature veto or passage without his signature. The bill allows for eight dispensary licensees, and under the bill, they can start dispensing and uh, marijuana and manufactured products on July 15th, 2016 with approval. So. That's pretty fascinating. Um, this is not the Texas ad story I wanted. Let's go to news.google.com and go Texas marijuana ads. This is where we'll leave you. Uh, God, if only those bikers that went into shooting in Waco, Texas were high instead of drunk, I feel like none of this stuff would be happening. Um, Texas marijuana ad. Here we go. 
from ABC 12 KSAT in Texas. Uh, let's look at this ad. This is an actually a news story about the ads, I guess. There's a lot to love about Freddy's frozen custard. Thank you, Freddy's. We don't want the sponsorship here. Um, I guess the ads are not anywhere other than there. The ad is scheduled to air on CNN, ESPN, and Fox News in the four biggest media markets at Houston, San Antonio, Dallas, and Austin. Uh, Criminalized marijuana in Texas, a cable TV ad airing in a few major cities, including San Antonio. Now, the bill the ad supports makes having under an ounce of pot only a citation offense. But local law enforcement say some of the commercial's arguments don't add up. Our KSAT people poll, we want to know if you agree with the ad's message. You can vote right now at KSAT.com slash people poll as slash the merger people poll. breaks down these, this controversial commercial. People who have commercial. of alcohol are much more problematic. The ad features a former narcotics detective speaking in support of the decriminalization bill. Our state cannot afford to keep arresting people and putting them in jail for marijuana possession. Now a Texas Hill Country resident, the former California officer spoke with KSAT on the phone. People in Texas are ready to, to have this possession. More than 70,000 people were arrested in Texas in 2013 on marijuana possession charges. However, the Bear County Sheriff says very few people in our county jail are there only for small amounts of marijuana pointing to one day when there were only 15 such people in the jail. Most of those weren't even eligible to bond out because if they had violated a condition of their pretrial release or probation. Another concern in the ad, use of police time. They need to be there to protect the public, to respond to crimes such as robbery, burglaries, rape, and murders. But the sheriff says they don't spend much time pursuing small drug offenses. They're usually in conjunction with something else. And the first assistant DA says those crimes are the sort of things detectives would handle. Low-level possession arrests are usually something a patrol officer would deal with. Because of the, the different investigatory nature that's involved, um, we don't see that being a problem. Garrett Berger, KSAT 12 News. That ad runs through midnight on Thursday. That's the deadline for the State House of Representatives to pass the bill on to the State Senate. Okay, so that was, they were talking about Thursday. I think that was last Thursday. I don't know about uh, whether or not that passed. I tell you what, I will research that and get back to you on the next edition here, 23 hours from now. In the meantime, thanks for watching. I'm Seabass. We'll see you next time on the 420 Legalization Nation, hopefully with a better title, huh?